the Old Testament reading this morning, it tells about God's call to the prophet Jeremiah. We know from many of the Bible stories that you are never too old to serve. And apparently youth won't get you a deferral either. Starting with chapter 4, Jeremiah, uh, chapter 1, verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And then I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you will speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow to build and to plant. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul's sublime hymn about love is a favorite biblical passage for many people. But if you listen carefully, you will find that it is also a very hard work. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 through 13. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. May we be blessed by these holy words and be a shining example of them. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and 
have not love, I am but a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. But the Apostle Paul here is not talking about the love that we have for our significant other. Even though most people associate this passage with weddings, it's not about that. What Paul is talking about here is unity in the body of Christ, unity within the church. A few years ago, I did a study on spiritual gifts, and we culminated our class with a study on 1 Corinthians 13. Let's hit a few highlights of that and maybe take this a step further. Now, first, Let's talk about love. I love my wife. I love my little buddy, Barney. He's my beagle. I love my daughters. I love my brother. I love my sister. I love my Christian brothers and sisters. I love my church. I love those little Lindor dark chocolate <laughs> Now I have used the same word for each of those illustrations. The Greeks, however, were a little bit more specific. They have four words to replace our one for the word love. Storge refers to the love, the natural affection between a parent and child. Eros is romantic or erotic love. Philia is friendship love, brotherly love. Agape is unconditional love, the love that God has for us, and the love that we have for each other as Christian brothers and sisters. Here in this chapter, Paul is using the word agape. Do you remember how the old King James Version of the Bible translated agape in this passage? It used the word charity. Now I like this because when we think of charity, we think, uh, well, it's, it's kind of like agape. Because agape love, like charity, is an action. It's not an emotion. So let's take a look at this chapter. Paul has been writing to the Corinthians about spiritual gifts, what they are, how are we to use our gifts together for the work of the church. He begins by stating that even if we have great spiritual gifts and we use them without love, it's useless. It gains nothing. It's distracting. It's worse than not having those gifts in the first place. One of my favorite composers, Tchaikovsky, uses symbols frequently in his compositions. Think of the 1812 Overture. Now, you've got to love classical music that incorporates artillery. <laughs> but now think of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. Symbols, or howitzers for that matter, not only do they not add anything, but they're rather irritating in this piece. Next, Paul gives us a list of what love is and what it is not. Most of these need no explanation. Love is patient. I've had issues with that most of my life. Love is kind. Little eight-year-old Maddie explain the difference between nice and kind. She was describing a particular relative to her grandmother and said that this was a kind person. And her grandmother replied, yes, yeah, she is nice. And Maddie spoke up, oh no, someone is nice when they want you to think that she's kind. <laughs> Eight years old. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant, or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. Love does not rejoice in 
some wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Such as a person experiences a spiritual closeness or maybe shares an intimate experience. We do have to practice discernment in what we believe, but let's give people the benefit of the doubt. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. It appears that this would be a rather difficult task to do all of these things. But let me borrow a line from Jesus. With people, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. How so? Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, talks about living in the Spirit of God. Here's another quick mini Greek lesson. In the original Greek New Testament, it was written in all capital letters. There was no spaces, no punctuation marks, no sentence, no paragraph structure. Paul writes in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, most in, uh, translations insert a comma after the word love. But in keeping continuity with 1 Corinthians 13, I think it would be just as proper to use a colon or a dash there instead. So Paul is giving us a list of the attributes of the fruit of the Spirit. He's telling us that the fruit of the Spirit is love. And then keeping with 1 Corinthians 13, he gives us a list of those attributes of love. So it could be read as, the fruit of the Spirit is love, which is joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As Paul starts to wrap this up, he talks about the lasting power of love. Now let's keep in mind here that love is used as an attribute of the fruit of the Spirit. Love is also used as an attribute of God. In 1 John 4, 8, John says that God is love. So I think I would agree with Paul's statement, love never ends. But then Paul gives us something more to chew on. What we know now is not complete. It's the same as comparing the knowledge of a child with that of an adult. Now we see in a mirror, dimly. My daughter has one of these mirrors that is very clear and it magnifies your reflection. The mirrors of Paul's day were nothing like what we have today. They were made from impure glass. And at best, they were polished metal, much like what you would see uh, in a uh, restroom at a roadside rest stop. When it comes to difficult questions, especially questions of faith, it is difficult for us to reach conclusions. But because, as Paul has just told us, what we know now is not complete. Just as a child is unable to understand all the facts of the situation, we are unable to understand completely. What we do see is like looking in a dim mirror. We just do not see or understand all that is there. This last week, I was working on a picture of a dragonfly. It started out as a dragonfly on some lily, pad, lily pads. As I was cropping and then magnifying the image, Lots of new components of that digital image started to come to life. Details that I had missed before were now visible. Little bugs, little bubbles on the stems of the lily pads under the water. All sorts of life that I had missed before because I was looking at the original photo. It was like looking through a dark glass. The interesting thing is, in the original picture, I did not know that I was missing all that until I started to enlarge the image. We do not have all the answers. 
I would be arrogant to think that I do know all the answers. And Paul has just told me that love is not arrogant. It would be reassuring to think I have the answers, but Paul has just told me that I only know in part. I'm looking in a dim mirror. We know in part. We do not have all the facts. We cannot know until Paul describes as the complete comes. That is, until we arrive in heaven. So, we step out in faith. Last Sunday, at our annual meeting, we passed a budget for the coming year with an anticipated expenditures being greater than the pledge giving for 2016. We've done this in previous years, and it has accurately been called a faith based budget. When we don't see with certainty, that is faith. You don't need faith if you have certainty. We do not see. We do not know where the money will come from, but we have faith that the money will come. The writer to the letter of the Hebrews described faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. When I saw the lectionary readings for today, I thought it was appropriate. In recent months, some issues have been challenging our own unity as a church, and our lack of unity has caused me some great distress. It breaks my heart to see us torn this way. And while I'm not going to go into the personal details of my own personal study this morning, that would take far too long. I did want to share just one aspect of my own decision. And that is this passage from 1 Corinthians 13. If anyone cares to discuss it further, I would be more than happy to discuss my journey. In recent years, I have thought hard about this topic. I have studied it. I have weighed that with what I have learned growing up in the church. Now, there's convincing arguments on both sides. But in coming to my own decision, I used a process that was originally outlined by theologian John Wesley. I used the elements of Scripture, tempered with reason, tradition, personal experience and accompanied by much prayer. My belief is strong and confident and my faith is certain. But about the issues about which we are contending, how can I know that I am absolutely correct? What do I know for certain? God gives me clues. He points me in a direction. I hate to admit it, but I'm not 100% certain. I wish I was. It would make all my decisions easier. One of the few things that I do know for certain is that God loves us. God loves me. Love is not only demanded of us, but it is promised to us, and it's lavished on us. If I refuse to love, my actions break the heart of God. But even then, God still loves me. Whichever way we decide on critical issues, we face the risk of being wrong. With such a risk, I would rather be on the side of love. And I ask for God's leading as we continue this journey. Thanks be to God.